Hello, my name is Lucian Lombardo. I'm an actively retired college professor, which means I still teach and I also continue to engage in advocacy work, focusing on ending child maltreatment. I was introduced to human dignity and humiliation, though not in those terms, 50 years ago, when I started my teaching career in a maximum security prison in Auburn, New York. 25 years later, the lessons I learned in my prison work were again encountered and reinforced as I tried to understand and teach about violence in the world of children. I guess prisoners and children often experience human dignity and humiliation in similar ways. <coughs> Today, those experiences combined with lessons and positive energy gained from the Human Dignity and Humiliation Studies Annual Workshop on Transforming Humiliation and Violent Conflict. These workshops helped me bring a dignity focus to schools, local government, and human services in the community where I live. Some examples to shape, to, to shape my understanding of human dignity. First, when I worked in the prison, when I started there, I was observing and struggling to understand the men, their situation, and myself as I sought ways to teach English, reading, writing, to prisoners who came to my classroom. Here are a few observations from that time. These come from a small paper that I wrote just for myself <clears throat> called Observations on the Existential Crisis of the Criminal. I wrote this in 1971. Our criminal is a man of intense feeling. He sincerely cares about others. He desires more than anything else to express these feelings to himself and others. Whenever he strives to express himself and be heard, however, he finds himself facing a pair of impenetrable barriers. The first is the apathy of the communicative self of the others who are around him. To him, they are insular, self-group contained. From the criminal's perspective, they communicate nothing but banalities and trivialities. The prisoner's second barrier is himself. He feels he sees like an artist. He knows social hypocrisy. He feels the other person's apathy more strongly than perhaps anyone else. He needs to communicate or at least feels the need. He needs to be seen as a person by another person in order to see himself as a person and to verify his worth as person connected to others. In his being, he feels and senses these needs. However, he is unable or only vaguely able to transform these feelings and sensations into knowledge existing in his conscious self. From the prison, 25 years later, to college students, writing about their experiences with human dignity as children. <coughs> the students reflected their ideas in an assignment, having them write about when their human dignity was supported and violated when they were children, and how they would define human dignity as children. The first set of phrases they used were about how they saw themselves. Terms like self-worth, self-esteem, self-value appeared. <laughs> Students also linked the idea of dignity in childhood to authenticity. Phrases like pride in my abilities, being able to be who and what I am, being able to be myself, being comfortable with what and who I am. Second. Students saw human dignity as stemming from their interactions with others. Around such themes as power and control, were they able to make or have input into family decisions? Were they experienced not being controlled, having freedoms over their body, their feelings, their opinions? Or how they were treated by others with fairness, respect, and value? Finally, students observed that dignity grew from experiences where they were able to contribute to others 
and to help others. Here's a quote from R.D. Lang, a Scottish psychiatrist, about the game. I think it applies to both prisoners and children and to all of us. This was written in a book called Knots in 1970. They are playing a game. They are playing at not playing a game. If I show them that I see they are, I shall break the rules and they will punish me. I must play their game with not seeing I see the game. I read this poem with prisoners and they certainly felt that that was right on the money. With college students, they saw this in their childhood experience when adults violated their human dignity. This not reflects, I believe, Alice Miller's idea of poisonous pedagogy where children cannot accuse parents of having harmed them. A second short writing is relevant to my learning about human dignity it comes from peace linguist Francisco Cardozo Gomez de Matos in his book, Dignity. Matos says, although dignity may be too complex scientifically to define, Educationally, it is a life-improving force, harmonizingly yours and mine. Dignity is a process, integrating character, conduct, communication. From these experiences and from these readings, what's my conclusion at this point? <clears throat> what does human dignity mean to me? Dignity is an essence of our lives and a process that connects us to others and with our life's meaning. Disney is not something to be earned. Rather, it's something that we all have, but something that can be supported or violated in our experiences. Dignity is always in us and between us. Dignity is not granted by a judgment of someone or some group who presumes the power to judge. Unlike justice, equality, fairness, equity, dignity is not debatable nor subject to codification through legal processes. Dignity is not a subject to be measured. Dignity is not based on judgments about persons or a people, or as Cervantes says, the odious comparison. Dignity is not political. Dignity is in us all and between us all. Thank you.